My name is Lena Berg. I'm the director of False Belief, uh, a feature-length uh, film that premiered in Form Expanded. The story transform, was transformed from uh, me being a racist, and I think that he didn't, they didn't think about it. And then when they were aware that you were around, they decided, well, we can't accuse him of being a racist because, you know, there's, 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 there's a white woman involved. So then, of course, uh, um, he could possibly try to uh, create the image that I am somebody who's, who is against homosexual unions, which is absurd. One of my best friends in this neighborhood is, is, is Michael Johnson, a man who was half of the first couple that was married in New York State after the, the laws were changed that would allow uh, gay partners to be ma officially married. Smallman asked us to bring photos to the trial that could show that Lee has a quote-unquote normal social life. Hello and welcome to the 33rd Teddy Awards. I'm Hannah Comden and I'm here with director Lena Berg to talk about her documentary False Belief. Hi and welcome to the Berlinale. Thank you. Uh, so obviously the film is incredibly personal to you. It, it documents the sort of uh, events that happened to your partner who's referred to as D in the film. I wondered how you found the process of putting together something that was so personal to your own experiences. It was a very um, challenging thing to do. I don't normally work with autobiography, autobiographical things and also the story is not over, so the case that False Belief is about is basically just the first part of it, so it's still ongoing, also as we started to edit or make it. So, in a sense, it was like being uh, going backwards and forwards at the same time, which is very, um, yeah, it's a hard thing to do. Mm. Um, on the other hand, it also is kind of an investigation for me, because as all these things unfolded, we didn't really understand what was going on, what, why, was, why things were happening. We still don't, but uh, to make a film sort of makes it clear what we don't know. And, and we also have then speculations about why, why, hap why this happened. Yeah. And you talk in the film a lot about being trapped in sort of their story, so trapped in, in a narrative that's been built by someone else. Did you see this as forming or being an author of your own narrative, or for both of you, an author of, mm. of what happened? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think also because I work with storytelling, it's also uh, uh, interesting and also in this case scary to be in someone else's story and you don't have any control what kind of story they're telling about you. And then, of course, to feel that you're com almost completely powerless um, uh, in, a, in, <clears throat> in a justice system, a bureaucratic system also. Of course, to be able to do a film is a kind of uh, taking the power over it and also just to be able to basically tell my story or our story and try to do it as uh, kind of my idea was as simple as possible, always really complicated, both as the events are complicated but also the reasons are very complicated and to do that as simply as possible was, was also a challenge, but uh, f maybe the fun part of it also as a challenge to yeah. find the a language for it. Basically. Yeah, and the sort of premise for Dee's arrest is incredibly complex and, and the power dynamics that exist within this case are very complex. So we've got this gay couple essentially that are falsely accusing Dee of some sort of harassment. Uh, and it seems so odd that this sort of minority group is turning on another minority group mm -hmm. and using ingrained prejudices to sort of further that mm -hmm. case. Why, why do you think that happens? Because actually that's, that's quite common in society for a minority group to, to then turn on another minority mm -hmm. group when nobody seems to profit from mm -hmm. that. I think that in a sense it is a... Uh, I mean, it's a good thing for the let's say the powers in place when minorities uh, 
I played against each other. It's like apartheid was all about to make a lot of groups <laughs> that can fight. And then basically the main power structure is unthreatened. Uh, if you see like really a big image or a big picture of it. But I think in this case, I thought also that was one of the reasons it took me a long time to decide to do a film about it because I thought that was also troubling in a way that I didn't know how to deal with the fact that uh, the gay uh, couple is accusing him falsely of, of having a homophobic thing. But, but how do you, I don't want to you know, put someone in a spot or, or make it as if all gay people are like, because categories work that way a lot. Mm. But I think we found a way to deal with it in the film where it's not. I think that what is the most troubling part of this conflict, one, that uh, it's kind of a pattern in New York City, at least I heard several of these stories, um, and that um, it's, um, it covers the real conflict. So, basically using a, a black against gay people or gay as a cover for a totally different uh, um, uh, conflict which has to do with lifestyle and, and how these urban areas develop. And I think somehow the house owners, the homeowners in the area of Harlem where we live, they bring a kind of a suburban idea of, of, uh, of life. Uh, whereas the urban idea, which is also New York City and Manhattan has been known for, uh, is a different idea of diversity. It's less homogenic. It's uh, and and I think the, to to rephrase that conflict into a, a question of sexual identity is is just to cover that there is a, a lifestyle, a worldview in that are actually they are battling. Yeah. That's the real battle somehow. Do we want totally? clean cities, uh, predictable areas where everyone has the same opinion, uh, live life the same way, or do we want diverse diversity? Um, and this, I think, is you see similar development in Berlin, in Oslo, Stockholm, also cities I know well. <coughs> but in this case, it's sort of uh, what should I, uh, taken to a very uh, uh, extreme. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting that you, so you do the narration in the film, and that at one point you say that as, there were aspects of gentrification that you hadn't noticed but that Dee had. Mm. And I wondered how you went about sort of negotiating the dual perspectives in the film, because obviously your perspective as a white woman is very different from Dee as a mm, black man yeah. in this society. Um, yeah, and I thought that was also... Uh, you know, the, the, the reason for me as a white, a European, to tell this story would also be that I am the outsider and I didn't really understand what was going on for a long time. Even now I don't really understand. Yeah. But, but um, and it, we thought when we, uh, when we kind of built the film that, okay, this story is the kind of the spine and he's telling his story. My part of the story is kind of to complement his things, but also then to, to um, uh, to then enter this alien perspective that I have <laughs> as an alien or as a, as a foreigner. Um, and I think that between, I mean, he, Dee told me long before things happened often what was going to happen. And I thought, no, it's not possible. Yeah. Uh, they are not hiding behind the flower pot to set you up. But then sort of it happens and okay, there is something going on. You know, like, so for me, it took a long time to believe it. On the other hand, I think that also, both D and I had uh, had somehow a faith that this can't, you know, can't be so unjust. It can't be so far out. It can't be so with no evidence, not no crime committed. Uh, I actually didn't believe, even when it happened somehow, that it happened sometimes. Yeah, it's funny. As a viewer, I had a similar thing. I was sort of watching, thinking, this this is absurd. How can this? How can these events be actually? Yeah. And I think happening? one of the most for me, the first time I really, when they presented the, these black and white photos that are in the film as proof of, of a crime when there are only images of a man walking down the street he lives on and, yeah. and that the lawyers, everyone said, this is serious. And I tried to ask him, what, what is serious about this? I mean, he walks down that street every day and he's singing or whatever he's doing, but it's, yeah. But that, that as evidence, that that was accepted as evidence was for me, I was wondering, you know, what, what how do we interpret images? And coming also from film and art, it's like the discussion that we have about what images are didn't enter the the you know the realm of the courtroom. It's like yeah. <laughs> you could present any image and it would be oh this is who he is. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask about that because 
I thought it was interesting that given photos are such a large part of the prosecution case, mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting that you guys turned to photos as a way to tell your story mm -hmm. and also and also these sort of collage cutouts. Can you explain a bit about your formal mm -hmm. choices? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, um, to begin with, I didn't really realize that I was, in a sense, producing evidence uh, <laughs> also. Uh, and, but I, I, I was aware of the, this kind of the discussion that I, or the, um, the thoughts around this uh, photo as evidence and what is photographic images, what are moving images. They are also very different in the, how we read them. So in a sense, the, my part of the film, the language of the film, is also kind of resembles an evidence, collection of evidence. I'm moving in them around, also trying to find new relationships between different images. The cutouts was really also an answer to a kind of a practical problem in the sense that there are many names and many um, uh, characters that we meet once or twice. And it was hard to follow the story without having any kind of visual uh, for them. Yeah. So, and the cutouts, I used that in another film earlier, and I like this, um, it's a, for me, kind of a power uh, thing also, that I can make, you know, the district attorney into a paper doll, and I can sort of move him around. It's a, for a moment, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of <laughs> directing the others, uh, which I sort of also uh, enjoy, basically. I find it funny also. Yeah, I mean, it does have that effect that you're obviously talking about something very seriously, but they almost seem like kind of puppets that, which, which maybe is, is what they are um, for, for also, within, yeah. within the criminal justice system. Um, yeah, so uh, the other thing I, I wondered was, has this affected your relationship in any way with Dee? Because obviously making a, f a film and, and the events that have actually taken place, has, has that changed your relationship in any way? I think... Oh, oh, absolutely. I mean, but anything that would have happened would have changed. I mean, we've been together for a long time, so that changes all the time. But but doing um, this film, of course, um, it's also kind of um, what is it? We um, uh, it also brings things together and a way of discussing them, which are different from if we just discuss it over a breakfast or something, because it's actually it's there as images. So how much it affected us, I can't say, but I, I think it affected our view of what we've been through and will affect it also, because something happens when other people see it and other people react to it and have a respond to it. Um, and then I think that um, the scary part of it is kind of that we put our own lives, our own things out there, which neither of us actually wanted, but we saw it as kind of the the best way or the yeah the, the story was so um, telling in many ways because I don't think it's an extraordinary story it's a you know it's basically a simple little criminal case but it has huge consequences and what you see in the Raymond Courts in Manhattan this is like it's an assembly line of cases like this that you really don't know it's just like producing a lot of uh, prisoners mm. <laughs> and a lot of and this I thought that we we sort of watch it from really down on the like frog level, as I would say, like, instead of the bird level, which would be to have an overview of, of, of the whole thing. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of what we could bring to, to the table somehow, that it isn't spectacular, it isn't, but it's still uh, a lot of, of details that are very, very uh, interesting and troubling. Yeah. And do you have any contact with uh, I don't know, it's not his real name, but he referred to as Kostakos in the film. Do you have any contact with him still? No, and I never, I don't know uh, any of the, uh, these neighbors. I, um, I, we can't contact them. This is a restraining order thing, so if I was to contact them, uh, Dee risks to be arrested because he cannot violate, he cannot approach them in any way, which also makes it impossible for him to do a legal or any civil suit or anything because basically he's afraid of if not po impossible, at least very <coughs> difficult. But I also, I must admit, I'm not really interested in them, yeah. in the sense that in our story they are not people, they are paper figures. They're just, I know the names, I read the transcripts, and I saw him behind, you know, cars and flower pots and track. But I don't, they are not really people for me, that sense. Yeah. They're really examples of something. And, but the reason I chose to still 
use names that are identifiable in the in the film. But I think that there is something important also to to not make it like to just not make it only like a metaphor or a symbolic story. It is also really done by people who <laughs> said exactly these things and. In, the film is not really a documentary in the sense of being journalistic, but it's. I wanted it to be factual on all the quotes. They, you know, I tried to make them speak through their quotes. So all of that is like really from the police reports, from the hearings, from the uh, court, the trial. Because, and I think I chose quotes uh, that represent very well what, how the case was built, and what, uh, yeah, the charges that we don't even really know who they were, what they were, but this were kind of, in the, what is in the film is what he was charged with. It is a, a lot of different kind of um, accusations, but very vague, unpleasant things. And how do you both find when you watch, maybe when you watch the film back for the first time mm -hmm. after you completed it, did you feel anything cathartic about watching it back or does it just make you more angry? It's very different from the film. Sometimes, uh, and this is also, I think in any uh, film or artistic project, there are, there are moments when reality comes through, which is often the good moments, uh, where you feel that this is real in a poetic sense or in a aesthetic sense. In this case, I think that sometimes I feel really happy that it's there and it's tall and it's out there. And then I can also uh, get this, yeah, almost, it's even worse because it's still going on. So and we've made it, yeah. <laughs> it's still going on. So uh, it really d depends on, I think, other things, also moods and what goes on, you know, around us. Yeah, and do you have any uh, hope for things changing or that the sort of systems of oppression that you're looking at, I mean, how can we change them? Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, otherwise I think I wouldn't have uh, done the, the film. I think the film has a um, activist side to it, absolutely, that it's just, I think that just by telling the story, but some people listening to it, it's also part of a possible change, but I think some of the things that uh, the film um, contains is huge systemic uh, problems in the justice system, it's not something you turn overnight or change overnight, but I think talking about it and also that uh, one film can open for other stories to be told about it but because we have the spectacular cases of you know black people being shot in the street or those reach the news but there are lots of these just uh, normal stories almost <laughs> um, that we don't know about and they are very many I think and um, maybe yeah so when one com one film or story comes out others will also um, so sort of be encouraged to tell stories. Yeah, Their and stories. I, I suppose on that note, the, the background of this conflict is this sort of increasing gentrification of the Harlem area. And you say that there are sort of multiple other cases. Have you spoken to other people who have experienced the same and would, would you consider almost expanding this as a project and, and trying to document multiple cases like this? Yeah, I, actually my original idea was to do a hearing. I did that on, on surveillance in Norway once, it's like a hearing situation. And I would love to do that, not necessarily that I do it, but to set up a, a system or a production unit that could do this as a... And I'm still kind of toiling with that idea because I think, um, um, what do you say, when you kind of uh, have many stories surrounding the same theme or the same problem, it creates a different image and also the diversity of, and complexity of a problem like this. So, but I don't know, for instance, how to really how to phrase it. Is it a racist thing? Should, be, should it be about, you know, uh, violence, racism within the justice system? Or is it even more systemic than that? Is it poor people? You know, how, how do you phrase it? That is kind of, a, I don't know. But I would like to do that, the kind of, I did a film called Kopfkino uh, some years ago, which is really just, um, you know, many people telling their stories around the same theme. And I find the beauty in this, that it's both personal, but also part of a collective uh, experience. Yeah. Mm. And so you, you'd had your premiere already? Yes. And was Dee able to, to be there? No. Oh. Dee can still not travel. Okay. Um, so, which is also, we had thought when we started the film two years ago that he would by now be able to, but he hasn't been and we still decided to do the premiere without him. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, but we had a, a, 
letter, the, the letter D on the chair <laughs> in the <laughs> cinema to mark his absence. Okay. Well, best of luck then with the case. Um, and yeah, I hope that the right kind of justice comes about. Um, yeah. and, and thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you.